Hello, beautiful Crystal Confab family. Thank you so much for listening or watching our episodes each week. This week, we're exploring the magical crystal of Moonstone. Now, the really interesting thing is, is we're really organized and we pre-record a few weeks ahead so that we always have some episodes in the bag in case we have any tech issues or anything like that. And we were talking about, and we're going to talk about in this episode, about the full moon. Now, for some reason, I got my wires crossed and thought we were already up for the full moon in Cancer. Of course not. This week is the full moon in Taurus. A really great time at looking at your financials and your physical well-being, as in your security in that way. So forgive me when I talk about the full moon in Cancer. I'm two moons ahead of myself, but enjoy the episode anyway. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Crystal Confab. Hopefully you're sitting out under a beautiful full moon as you listen to our heavenly voices because today we're going to be talking about Moonstone. Today I'm joined by Nicholas and Kyle and we are going to dive deep into the crystal that is the epitome of lunar energy and we're really excited for you to join us uh, for this conversation or this confab. So Obviously, with such a dazzling crystal, there's going to be a lot of different stories and kind of folklore about Moonstone. So who better to share a little bit more about that than Nicholas? What can you tell us about Moonstone, Nicholas? I can probably tell us more than is productive. So let's let's start with like the origin of the name. Um, What we call Moonstone today uh, got that designation in the early 19th century. Um, at least in in the English language. Um, But other stones had been known as moonstones in other languages for, I mean, at least several centuries. The earliest written record that we have about a stone that we assume to be moonstone um, comes from Pliny the Elder uh, in, in Rome. And he referred to it under a few different names. Uh, One of them is derived from the same root as the word for star. So it would be called like astrites or astroites um, and uh, would also take on the name Selenites uh, after the Greek goddess Selene. Uh, However, it's important to note that like what we think of as moonstone may not have been what they thought of as moonstone, anything that had a kind of lunar glow to it. And if we look at some of the earliest written descriptions, more than likely in some cases, authors were talking about really flashy adularescent feldspars. Sometimes they were probably talking about gypsum and mica, and in other cases they might have even been describing good old-fashioned white marble or pale colored jaspers. And um, you know, ultimately it was just any stone that reminded folks of the moon itself. And even today we don't have a single mineral species that can be called moonstone. Um, it's more an optical phenomena than it is a physical discrete substance. Um, but when we look at some of this ancient lore, it, it is that phenomenon that drives the magic, the mystery, the medicine that it has to offer. Um, so we see it as being fairly protective, especially good at protecting for travelers. The idea being kind of tied to the lunar symbolism that in one lunar month, the, the moon travels through all 12 houses, all, all 12 slices of the pie that, that is our, our nighttime sky. And it doesn't matter if the moon is full or only halfway there, if it's practically non-existent, whatever state it's experiencing doesn't affect that journey and it's able to return back to that starting point. So the idea is no matter what we've got going on in our lives, when we carry moonstone, we're gonna make it back home safely. Um, the, loons, the moon's associations with the tides also meant that it was a really popular stone for sailors to wear while they were at sea for, you know, safe voyages. Um, there's some interesting ideas about the stone um, kind of waxing and waning with the, the moon's light. And uh, we, we probably find the best description of this coming um, in like the late medieval, early Renaissance, um, there was a French astrologer and physician by the name of Antoine Mizod who uh, uh, purportedly borrowed a very large and lustrous moonstone from Pope Leo X uh, to document what he saw in its, its uh, adularescence, its flash all month long. And he, he claimed that the old stories of the light in the stone waxing and waning with the moon cycles were true. 
And that, you know, kind of became holy writ, if it will, for several centuries until we learned better. Um, its folkloric origins are often attributed to the moon itself. Uh, the Romans maintained that it was solidified moonlight. Um, there's a, an alternate story that rocks that were exposed, particularly bright moonbeams, might develop moonstones within them. Um, there's a Sri Lankan myth that says that every so many generations when the ocean tides and the lunar tides converge, um, the, the result is that moonstones are borne by the waves themselves and carried to the shore. Um, so, you know, we get lots of interesting stories that kind of link it to the moon, even the pre-modern era. Um, one of my favorite things that people did with them, although I'm, I'm not suggesting we necessarily do this today, um, is from the earliest written record, moonstones were associated with, um, we'll say prophecy. Uh, it was thought that uh, not just holding a moonstone, but actually placing it under your tongue would confer a knowledge of future events. And whatever you would speak would give you, you know, prescience, would give you the power to speak it into existence, whether because you were predicting it or willing it to happen, not every lapidary text necessarily agrees. Um, you know, we see in, you know, our, our modern kind of magical uh, communities that the moon is associated with psychic development, with magic itself, with divination. So it's, um, you know, a, a perfect marriage, I think, of the, the traditional folkloric wisdom, our understanding of that planetary demology, um, and the power of Moonstone to stimulate our psychic senses. It all kind of goes hand in hand. So there's a lot of other fun stories about Moonstone um, that maybe we can save for the future. But um, what I really love is that this relatively obscure stone in, in the ancient world um, had, uh, you know, it, it's hard to find artifacts made from Moonstone. Uh, I, I had a project where I, I had to do just this, and the best I could do was find a handful of, like, um, treasure cases that you'd put holy writings in, you know, they're gilt and they're set with stones, and a couple of maybe Renaissance-era um, uh, artifacts that were related to um, relics, uh, saintly relics, but it, it really is about the 19th century that we start to see there is access mm -hmm. to Moonstone pretty regularly, and then the names get coined for it, um, and it would kind of pick up as we see the Art Nouveau movement coming, uh, you know, about a century or so later, and it, it really was uh, very fashionable then, and like all things that are fashionable, it went out of fashion until about the 1960s, when we get the rebirth of the um, kind of hippy dippy magical counterculture, uh, which saw the symbolism of the moon and those folkloric associations very much in alignment with their general ethos of living in connection to the cycles and seasons of the earth itself. And, and from there, it was picked up by the witchcraft revival, the modern metaphysical movement, and now is one of the most popular gems that we find in crystal healing today. Oh, so so true. Everyone's got to have a moonstone, I think, in their in their collection, don't they? It comes in early with such a dazzling stone as well. Absolutely. So, Kyle, when it comes to actually what is a moonstone, can you kind of shed a bit of light on that? Yeah, absolutely. This is something that I find quite interesting because I find the whole feldspar mineral family, which was what a moonstone lives under or our modern understanding of a moonstone, is in the feldspar group of crystals or minerals, which covers sunstone, labradorite, uh, amazonite, and of course our moonstone. What we know as moonstone trademarked, like, what should be a moonstone is a um, orthoclase feldspar. This is something that is uh, layered, and that's where the diffraction of light refer. <laughs> I always get these mixed up. The diffraction of light coming through, bouncing, coming back out, gives us that sort of white to blue shimmer or shiller or adolescence. There are many names for it, and it's all essentially the same thing. It's that beautiful hue that is white to blue, the really beautiful quality stuff. The clearer the stone will have a bluer flash, as you will see. 
Whereas what we call rainbow moonstone is actually white labradorite. It is a slightly different flavor of uh, feldspar, which is plagioclase. And it has, again, layering of two different uh, intermingling feldspars that create the light coming through and bouncing out in a rainbow of color. So it's sort of... Uh, opening up the spectrum of light as it comes in and bounces out more so than what moonstone, regular moonstone is. It's a repeated twinning of the two feldspars that creates that rainbow or labradorescence, which we know from labradorite. And white labradorite is rainbow moonstone. You see it because you see yellows and oranges. Um, you see these sorts of full spectrum colors that you don't see in regular moonstone. And that's really a huge, huge differentiation between them. You'll see um, quite often associated inclusions of black tourmaline. You'll see bytoite mica. You'll see the bluey greeny apatite. You'll see these little other mineral inclusions throughout. And I'm going to show you a little heart, which sort of actually shows all of that off, you can see the black, the little bit of blue. And it's this is essentially colourless uh, Labradorite. White is essentially colourless and it's got that, I don't know if the light's going to do the thing where it flashes in full spectrum, but that's what you get. That's why you see Rainbow Moonstone so flashy, so beautiful, so um, magical in its thing because it's Labradorite. And that's where, like... It's subtle, it is subtle, but it is also quite large because it's almost like saying, you know, uh, Morganite and Aquamarine are the same thing. It's like, well, their base is the same. They're both barrels, yes, but they're not essentially the same mineral afterwards because of extra things going on. Um, the other thing, this subtle scientific differences where in um, regular moonstone, you have high levels of potassium and in your uh, rainbow moonstone, the Labradorite, it's high levels of salt or sodium chloride. And it's like uh, uh, something, well, yeah, sodium. it's a salt or NA, sodium inclusion balance that's higher and it's quite nerdy, and I had to go through all of my notes to remind myself of all of the stuff um, about the two differences to make sure that I was, you know, explaining it as properly as I could. Um, and energetically, I find them to be very different as well. I find the um, the energy of your regular sort of moonstone to be more about that full moon illumination through sort of fogginess through the cycles of things I find it's a stone that's helped me energetically to really trust the processes to um, work with what's happening around me to not rush things to not force things to not move too quickly whereas with the rainbow moonstone I find it more sort of initiating Based, like it sort of gets things going, gets things moving, lifts things up. Um, I find there, um, it's, it's not fun to like gender things, but I find Rainbow Moonstone more genderless. It's less like one or the other, whereas I find White Moonstone especially super feminine, super divinely feminine, super receptive, super on that yin side of energy by comparison, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, wow. And one thing that I know, um, Ashley, who can't join us today, she was going to talk about there's obviously the white and the, the rainbow moonstone, but then we also, she likes to work with, I think, green moonstone and peach moonstone and there's black and brown moonstone. So where do they fit in the moonstone or the feldspar family? Well, they all sit in your regular uh, moonstones. They're all different flavours with a different colour base, and that's like... Um, the simplest way of breaking it down and they'll be just different mineral inclusions so your black moonstone for me is like new moon energy it's like going through the darkness going through the shadow to illuminate things there are two different flavors of green moonstone so you've got your gra granierite and then regular moonstone and they're slightly different because granierite i think is all about the um nickel and that's the green that you see running through the granierite and when i've worked with that compared to this like really soft green moonstone that i'm not 100 sure of the 
what makes the color the color. It could be copper. Um, I find their energies to be very different, but they are both sort of helping us to create, helping us to plant seeds, helping us to bring things. So I would say like waxing moon for your greens is really, really nice. My favorite of all the moonstones and the one I actually have the closest relationship with is peach peach moonstone and I think it's a very important stone for so many people because at its core it's like everything is going to be okay you are going to be okay and relax I literally had one of the biggest anxiety attacks I've ever had when I was on holiday in Thailand the weather was horrible we were stuck in our hotel like it was monsoonal it was like we were not having a good time I was feeling a bit not having a good time and my husband literally said, let's go for a walk. Just let's like get out. <sighs> we can't control this, but we can just go for a walk along the beach. And we sort of went through the little town and then to the, towards the beach. And as we went down this little alley, we turned and there was this little temple with this huge statue of Kuan Yin, which was just like a huge, she appears all the time for me when I need to. Just like bring myself a bit of compassion, bring myself a bit of love, remind myself like I don't need to control everything, just relax and take care of yourself. Then that night we were at a market and there was a lady running a market stall and she just looked at me and she said, you need this, you need this, just take this, have it, you need it, it's yours. And it's rainbow moonstone in a necklace and I've had it for nearly a decade now and it's like a mala, it's like a rosary, it's like one of those ones that just feels so so good and I don't know if it's the peachy color I don't know if it's because it was a gift but every time I've ever experienced and worked with any flavor of peach moonstone it just makes me feel good like the warm peach fuzz energy like is literally in there and it's like it doesn't matter what stage of the cycle you can see in front of you in your physical life it helps you to intuitively go I'm okay and I'm going to be okay and I will make sure that I can just chill because I'm going to create that space for myself. Doesn't matter what I see. Doesn't matter what I'm feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I think it's a, like Peach Moonstone being an orange crystal as well, really great one to have in your collection for the sacral chakra. When you think of our most common orange crystals, they are things like carnelian, I guess sunstone, maybe fire, I get fire opal and that type of thing. They're all quite projective and yang in their energy. But when we think about the sacral chakra, it's connected to the reproductive system. It's connected to intimacy. It's connected to a bit of vulnerability. And it almost, you know, and it's connected to the element of water. And so I think sometimes we don't need to necessarily add more fire to that energy center. We do need that more kind of lunar energy. And I think peach moonstone is a perfect one for the sacral chakra in that way. Absolutely, without question. Yeah, Nick, do you, uh, sorry, Nicholas, we keep on abbreviating us Australians. Nicholas, do you um, do you work much with the other colours as well? I do. My my favourite variety, hands down, is the kind of black, silver, grey stuff that you can find. Um, you know, obviously the, the variety of that that is most abundant on the market is what we see coming out of Madagascar, which is that kind of um, orthoclase variety, but um, there is a really lovely um, find of it out in Virginia here in the States um, that is um, a different potassium feldspar. And I cannot remember its exact composition, but it's really, really fine grained and um, it will produce like a bright silver shine. Um, the color itself can be kind of a, a greeny gray to almost black. Um, and I just, I find it really charming. It's, it's fairly opaque. It doesn't have the transparency we see in a lot of other um, moonstones, but I think that's one of the things that I really love about it. Uh, I also really love um, uh, the moonstone that's coming out of Wisconsin. And uh, this is an anorthoclase uh, feldspar rather than our typical orthoclase. And it has this electric blue flash against a kind of peachy to brown um, background color because the, um, the as Kyle was talking about the twinned layers that we see in it due to the immiscibility the the inability of certain feldspars to to totally integrate with one another um, they're they're so fine that they diffract out that really high wavelength of light and you look at this otherwise really drab stone you're not expecting such a bright flash to come out of it and and boom there it is it's just so 
so vibrant. You got to catch a good quality one at the right angle, but it, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, wow. Yeah, so I I love all the moonstones, um, but definitely I think those are my my two favorite. Mm, mm. No, I, I definitely can relate to, to Black Moonstone. And I think we could probably do a whole episode on Black Moonstone and for, you know, that new moon type of energy as well. But let's look a little bit deeper into that white moonstone and, and definitely that rainbow moonstone as well, which are kind of our full moon energies, especially since this week we do have the full moon in Cancer. Now, Cancer is a zodiac sign that is ruled by the moon. So, you know, there is no more lunar moon symbol than that type of thing. You know, there are lots of different ways, and maybe we'll dive into that in a second, that we would work with a moonstone under the full moon. But I actually am a really big fan of grabbing your moonstone. Uh, probably, you know, the moon, for me, I work with the full moon energy being over three nights. So on that first day before that first night, I think you need to slip on your moonstone. The reason being is obviously when we work with the lunar energy, it has this kind of, it, it's a yin energy. Most cultures, some do see it as being a more of a yang energy, but generally we find it's magical, it's intuitive, it's encouraging us to slow down. But as we know, because our Gregorian calendar and the lunar calendar aren't in sync, we don't get a beautiful full moon every fourth Sunday, which would be amazing if we could link it all up. It might happen on a Tuesday. It might happen on Thursday. It can happen any day of the week. And we don't get to slow down. You don't get to have the day off. You can't call in sick for work and go, sorry, I'm not coming in today because it's a full moon. So we live in a very yang world, which is like, go, 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 go all of the time. And we're trying to, we're rushing around. And we're not slowing down a little bit more in that type of thing. And so we know with crystals, uh, for many of us that have worked, you know, Kyle can, I'm sure, relate to this as well. When people are the when the full moon energy is around, the crystals all wake up a little bit more. People can become a little bit heightened. And so I find the full moon energy around this time, day and night, it's an amplifier. So it's really, really important. I find if you only get up and meditate one morning a month, it should be the morning of the full moon because how you start that day, it will amplify. If you start that day stressed, arguing with a partner, anxious about something, it's just going to spiral out of control. Or by the time the night comes, you're going to become a lunar tick. And if you speak to anyone in the police force or works at hospitals, they'll definitely agree that something happens on the full moon. So what we can do is we can't call in sick for work. We, we've still got to do our things that are required out of the day. But what we can do is we can slip on our moonstone, whether it be a piece of jewellery, whether it be a, you know, a, a small tumbled stone that you pop in your pocket or something like that. And that's just going to bring in a dose of yin energy. And it's going to help you navigate and, and kind of be in tune with the energies that are throughout that day. You may still go about your day and fulfill the the to-do list that you would normally have, but it might just bring in a bit more of a gentle energy to stop things spiralling out of control. Now, one thing that's worth looking at, especially for women, is that before the advent of electricity, most women's menstrual cycles were pretty much in, in tune with the lunar cycle. Now, we don't need to have a discussion, especially between three gentlemen here, about women's menstrual cycles at a deep level, but most women's menstrual cycles are totally out of sync with the moon now because of the advent of electricity. So Moonstone is really great for helping us all get in tune with this governing body that circulates around us of the moon. It helps us work with the lunar energy in the full moon. But it can, and I have seen women have had success with helping to balance out their menstrual cycles. And one little trick, I don't know if I could say as a gay male that I'm responsible for bringing children into this world, but a little basic grid that I sometimes recommend is if you are trying to fall pregnant, you put a moonstone on the female side of the bed, you put a carnelian on the male side of the bed, and at the bottom at the bed, so you're kind of making a bit of a triangle, a green adventuring. And carnelian, renowned for virility, uh, the moonstone, renowned for regulating menstrual cycles. And, uh, you know, I love green adventuring. It's a bit of a kickstarting of any form of fertility as well. Obviously, you can't just whack three crystals there and you're going to be having a baby in the morning type of thing. 
you've got to look at other things. You've got to look at your nutrition, your gut health and all, you know, hormones and all that as well. But sometimes that crystal energy can just bring in a little added extra as well. So give that a shot as well. So gentlemen, like Kyle, how do you tend to, do you reach for your moonstone each full moon? Uh, I am someone who wears a form of moonstone almost every day. Uh, like I will probably have, a, I've got literally a peach moonstone amongst my bracelets that I will wear most days. So I'm an almost everyday moonstone connector to a, um, but when it comes to the full moon, I will feel into what I'm feeling. And recently I've been able to get my hands on this really amazing combination of azurite and green moonstone. I don't even know where it's come from. Um, I've gotten it through work and I, this last couple of full moon cycles, I've been really drawn to it sort of intuitive energy like the azurite has really deepened the intuitive side of it and i'm not saying like find an obtuse flavor of moonstone but it's almost like whichever flavor you're drawn to whichever one you feel most connected to i think is the perfect one because we are all no matter what the cycles are happening around us we're all at a different cycle or a place in our own cycle in our own life so i think if you are drawn to gray moonstone at the full moon because things are a bit gray things are a bit mysterious you need a little bit more understanding work with it if you feel drawn to like a red moonstone something really deep something really uh, earthy with that sort of receptivity that's what you work with i think it's really important to trust that intuition but as a base white moonstone and rainbow moonstone are so illuminate illuminating they're perfect as a full moonstone mm. what about yourself nicholas will we find you donning a moonstone on the full moon uh, sometimes uh, I I tend to just kind of match the stones that I work with with my specific goals. Sometimes that includes an astrological impact. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, one thing that I will say is I'm I'm a very sensitive sleeper, and because the moon rules all nocturnal processes that include sleep, one of my favorite things to do with moonstone is to make like a little sweet dreams pouch with some relaxing herbs, maybe, you know, add an essential oil that you really like, and I'll pop a moonstone in there. I will tend to do either like a white or gray moonstone. I find them less stimulating than a rainbow moonstone would be. Um, and that's something that would be great. I, I sleep less well on um, nights on and around the full moon. So that is a case that you might catch me using um, moonstone very rigidly with the lunar cycle. Um, but I also use like the planetary rulers of the days of the week. And so, um, you know, if I, if I really need that boost at the start of my work week, um, I'll, I'll use Moonstone in tandem with that on a Monday named after the moon. Of course. I, I love this idea of your, of, of the sweet dreams bag. I know people are like dying. There are lots of people that, that have challenges with sleep. Can we get a few extra details of what, what are the things you pop in that bag? What herbs? Yeah, so I mean, uh, my my general rule of thumb when mixing botanicals together is, uh, especially if it's something that's going to be close to your face when you're sleeping, you should like the smell of it. So what I like the smell of, what you like the smell of, they can be different things. Lavender will go in mine, rose will go in mine. If you're not really big on florals, then you know maybe you can look at something that is soothing, um, like frankincense or um, you know citrus might be too bright for me, but you might find it really good for unwinding. Uh, lemongrass could be something you put in there. Linden, chamomile, um, some peppermint if you like, um, but things that just generally symbolize clarity and relaxation. It's a great kind of magical project for the night of the full moon, so we can draw in and you know heighten the moonstone's magic with that um, but in a pinch make it any day of the week and try to let moonstone energy wash over you and kind of help you ease into the tide and the rhythm of things because that's one thing we see with lunar tides they ebb and they flow um, and i think moonstone's a great um, ally whenever we're, we're either struggling with our own cycles or trying to fit our cycle into a bigger rhythm Mm, for sure. I love that. I love that. And, and I guess this is where I, it's a good segue. I'm going to introduce what many people call my ice cream pendant here, um, which is, you know, I, one of the things I think many of us love to do is combining crystals with other different things. Now, whether it be astrology, and as Nicholas just explained, each day of the week is ruled by a different planet and Monday is ruled by the moon. So working with that lunar energy on a Monday 
really makes sense and could be really quite powerful as well. You can obviously bring in corresponding plants. And so my ice cream pendant is actually a rainbow moonstone and maple wood. Now, I do a lot of traveling and maple is seen as sometimes referred to as a traveler's wood and very protective to help you navigate through the journeys of life. So whether you are traveling on a, you know, a far off holiday somewhere in an ancient land or a far off land, or whether you're just navigating through your life, maple can be a really nice combination with uh, Moonstone to help guard and guide you and kind of kick in that intuition as well. Another one that I love, I also my other love for, um, from the natural world is essential oils. And I love jasmine with, mo uh, with uh, Moonstone. The reason being, when we think about jasmine, it's a night blooming flower. Uh, that's when it normally opens. It's when, you know, I'm sure we've all had that experience where we walk past a jasmine bush and we smell it at night. Um, and so what, and when you look at the flowers, they look like a star. And so if you imagine that when we have the sea of stars above us and on a field of jasmine where it's growing, it's kind of that mirroring of those stars above. So that kind of as above, so below. Jasmine has that magical intoxicating, but also really great for helping to deal with um, those emotional um, challenges. It's one of the best oils you can use for depression. And so I actually went around the full moon. You'll see me donning my, my moonstone, normally my rainbow moonstone ring, but you'll probably either smell in my diffuser or smell on me jasmine essential oil, which can be a really nice pairing to help you just work and navigate through that lunar energy to get through the chaos of the day, get through the chaos of the night, but also enhance the the magical and intuitive abilities that are enhanced around that full moon as well. Carl, what about yourself? How Have you got any suggestions? You know, one thing I think is really important is we talk a lot about, and, and we find in so many books, this crystal's great for this, and this crystal's great for that. And then people buy it for love or for protection or for intuition, that kind of thing. But we don't tell people, well, why don't you try this? So I love Nicholas's idea of the sweet dreams bag. Have you got any suggestions on how people can work with Moonstone? Yeah, absolutely. For me, I love to remind people, and Nicholas touched on this earlier, is the protective qualities of, um, of Moonstone. I think any crystal that has a flash has a protective quality. It sort of is able to deflect and psh. so I find myself really recommending moonstone to a lot of people who find themselves cloudy during any period whether it be the full moon or any period because of everyone else's energy that um getting caught up in the madness getting caught up in the build-up i find it's a great one to just have on you have on your person have a little piece in your pocket to remind yourself that i can navigate even though i don't know everything I'm not all the energy that's happening around me, even though that's what I see. Like it reminds you that you are separate from all the things happening around you, even though you are a part of it. So you can kind of come back to yourself, trust yourself, take little steps. I find Moonstone and baby steps really helpful, like so that you don't have to rush the process. You don't have to be afraid of moving too quickly and it's a really really supportive stone and i always recommend it to people that need that little bit of support that little bit of nurturing that little bit of i can trust myself even if there's lots of noise happening even if there's lots of people going crazy around me even if there is um lots of stress i am able to kind of find my wholeness full moon moonstone and illuminate and shine the way through the darkness Mm. So for people that identify as empath, this would be a must-have crystal? Yeah, without question, without question. It's, uh, I think um, empathy is that thing that we all should have and to be able to work with Moonstone to remind us that like we're allowed to have our empathy and we still don't have to get caught up in everyone else's stuff, I think is a beautiful thing. It doesn't stop you from being in your feelings, it doesn't stop you from being nurturing, but it does stop you from kind of going, wait, that's actually not my problem. Mm. And, and Nicholas, I thought, gave a big nod as well when I said for empathy, fully agreed with that. Then do you believe that it matters for, like, maybe an empath? I think, you know, someone's tuned in at the moment, they're like, oh, okay, that, that sounds like one I need to work with because that can be, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people who seem to be empaths and they want to turn it off. I'm like, no, it's a superpower. We want to, you want to 
be a conduit of that energy, just not a container of that energy. And Moonstone could help with that. Does it matter? Do they need it in a ring? Do they need it in a bracelet? Do they need it as a pendant? Does it, you know, can I just whack a tumbled stone somewhere? What would be your opinion of that, Nicholas? I mean, my general rule of thumb when working with crystals is to select the format that matches your lifestyle. If we look at crystal energy through the lens of electromagnetism, it it isn't, or at least it isn't only that, but if it is energy, it has to follow the rules that all energy follows. Um, then so long as the energy of that stone and the energy of the human biofield are are touching, it's it's influencing you in some way or another. So if a tumbled stone in your pocket is the best way to do that for you, do that. If you want it around your wrist, around your neck, if it's easier to just put it on your desk at work because that's where you have the greatest need for it, do that. Um, but ultimately, um, do something you're going to enjoy because if you don't enjoy it, you won't be inclined to keep doing it. Yeah, fully agree. Kyle, would you agree with that too? 100%. Having something tactile that you can work with, that you can connect to in that way is awesome. But also if you live something, a life that's busy and go, 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 and you need to make sure it's just on you. Like I've got plugs in earrings that are moonstone and they're actually, you know, carved plugs that sit in my ear. So I know I'm going to be listening to the intuition. It's there. It's on my head and I don't have to think about it because it's literally there all day. Yeah, yeah. Well, what was that? Sorry, make it easy for yourself. Like literally, just make it as easy as possible for yourself, and you will find yourself connecting so much more easily to everything, especially crystals. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, I use this analogy a lot, but treat crystals like people, and just as you know, we can be influenced by people around us, however they are. So as long as the crystal is nearby, then it's going to have that influence for sure. So I, I love that. So this week with the full moon in Cancer, you know, this is the time, the Cancer is a sign of family. It's it, And that can be your blood family. It can also be your inner circle. Normally the people that you entrust with getting to know a little bit more than just what the public world knows about you. But it's also your home as well. I love Moonstone for helping us to connect more with that feminine, that emotional, that empathetic energy and connect more with those people that are really special with us. So what I would encourage you to do is find some time to sit quietly with your Moonstone this week and tune in to the people that are in your inner circle. You may might want to ask yourself, what do they need? How can I nurture them more? And how can I build those relationships to strengthen those relationships? You may need to do a bit of analysis and go, is there someone in my inner circle who is not, who's kind of dirty, muddying the water of my life? And maybe I need to make some changes in that way and really follow that guidance there. But sometimes you might also find that this is a really great full moon to focus on the home. It's a big, wild, scary world out there. And if you don't feel comfortable coming to your home as your kind of landing point where you can regenerate and nurture yourself, then what can be done to change that? Whether that is, you know, changing living arrangements, which sometimes is possible, sometimes not. Is it about just redecorating your home? Is it about decluttering your home and all those types of things? But really listen into the guidance that Moonstones brings you because it is so good at helping to just slow you down and actually listen. In this Yang world, we will rush so much that we kind of get to the end of the road, the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the year, and we're like, this is nowhere where I wanted to be. And it's just because we have keep on taking step after step after step in the wrong direction. So Moonstone is a beautiful one to work with, to guide you on that, and to help you listen to that inner, inner guidance. And that we who work with the moon, the great thing about it is that we're encouraged to check in once a month with where our life is going, as opposed to those who just work with the sun and wait till the 31st of December and go, oh, screw that year. That didn't work too well. This year will be better. And guess what they're saying next year? The same thing again. And so this is a really great opportunity to work with this lunar energy as well. Before we wrap up, Nicholas, Kyle, is there anything else that we you think we've missed about Moonstone that's another trait that people can draw into? I mean, there's so much we could say. There's there's so much magic Moonstone offers. And I think maybe a takeaway we haven't touched on is like, I think anyone who's met Moonstone has had that moment of just utter awe when you see those colors that flash, that light emerge from inside. It's 
the whole Feldspar family to me kind of embodies this sense of childlike wonder and Moonstone in particular because of its mythic and astrological associations I think is so good for helping us get into that imaginal flow, the ability to see and perceive and create and to allow our imagination to help us make a more magical life. Mm, so true. So I think we might wrap up the episode right there. Enough of listening and getting it all sorted. We want you to go and sit with your moonstone now, rediscover the magic of it, get it off the shelf, get it out of the drawer, slip it on, pop it in your pocket or sit with it and discover the magic of the world and the magic of moonstone. We'll see you next week for another Crystal Confab. Until then, take care and blessed be. Ciao.